Hello. Figured I'd get on, make sure everything works. <laughs> I do have you guys muted um, just because whenever I do uh, the videos, uh, you know, you'll hear the background or you'll hear it echo through and it can be weird. So um, I did set it up that as people join in, they're automatically muted. Uh, we do have a, I believe we have a comment area um, over to the side. And then uh, we are recording this also. There we go. Yeah, it's a chat area. So if you guys are on the computer, if you have any questions, uh, you can go ahead. If you're if you're doing this live, you can you can go ahead and, and ask questions over there. Technically, we have a minute for me to babble, and then we'll officially get started. Uh, if you guys have questions, like I said, this is my first, the first one. Hopefully, not the last one. Um, but but write them in there. Um, I've said there's no such thing as a stupid question, but that's been proven wrong. Um, but if you guys do have a question, probably somebody else has also. So, you know, just go ahead and, and type it in there. Um, or if it's something that maybe you know the answer to, but you want to make sure that we share with everybody, right? Um, go ahead and type it in there too. So, you know, sometimes I'll do that and I'll ask questions that, you know, like, because they need to be asked um, or because I think somebody else might have that same question, but they don't want to ask. So that works. Um, hopefully we'll keep this, well, we'll keep this probably a close half hour-ish is my goal, um, but we'll see how many sidetrack tangents we go down to. It is now officially 10 o'clock, which is official start time. So we're gonna get started. Um, my goal is to get this uploaded to YouTube when we're done and then strip out the audio for the podcast. So uh, it will be up there forever. Ha 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 ha. Uh, my name is Victoria Warfel with Hope Service Dogs. And this is our first Zoom meeting is what it's officially called. Apparently it's not called a webinar anymore. Zoom meeting on is a service dog right for you. And why we're doing this is I've been training service dogs for probably 18 years now and working a lot with owner trainers. And how I got started doing that is found a dog got her, trained her up, and she naturally alerted for me. I reached out to trainers in the area. Now, granted, this is 2022. We're talking the early 2000s. Uh, I reached out to trainers in the area. Nobody could help me. Nobody responded back to me. Nobody wanted to help me. And it was done via, via, via books and VHS tapes, because remember what the internet was back, like back in the early 2000s. It's kind of like prehistoric time. Like, yes, there was internet, but it was like dial up for most people, it wasn't fun. Uh, and definitely didn't have the resources that we have today. So did that and as I took the dog out in public with me as she did become my service dog uh, with those alerts, she, I had, my son was young, he's 20 now. He was you know, a couple of years old at the time, which is how I know how long it's been. Uh, but people would come up to me and ask me questions. And so we'd help them out. And when people started referring other people to me, I thought, oh, I could probably do something with this. And that's how dog training was born. You know, I had been helping out at the dog club. I had been helping people whenever they see me and they ask questions, but uh, you know, that's how it started. And the, as it started the people who came to me, you know, had questions when people found out I had a service dog within the service dog, people started coming to me and they had questions. And it was a lot of service dogs, you know, that we were working with that we were seeing, but they would come for private training or they'd come for board and train or they'd come for group classes. And it just wasn't enough. Um, we eventually put together a full service dog training program through Dream Dogs, which became Heart and Soul Dog Training. Um, so this was pre-Hope Service Dogs. Uh, and they would come out and we get to see the dogs through life, which was very helpful because what we found was the dogs, for some people, they, they weren't ready to have a service dog. For some people, it was the wrong breed. For other people, it was maybe the right breed, but the wrong dog. Because I've been telling people for years, my top three are golden retrievers, yellow or black Labrador retrievers, and standard poodles. So then people would see, you know, an ad on Craigslist or an ad on Facebook Marketplace that I have a golden retriever for sale and they'd go and they'd get that dog 
well, that dog didn't have the health testing. It wasn't ready for it. Uh, and it wouldn't work out for them. So we knew we wanted to do something about it, but it was a little bit daunting to start up our own 501c3 nonprofit. But I finally decided I've been putting this off for years and I can either keep putting it off for years and still be in the same spot or push through and get it. So we pushed through and that's how Hope was born. Um, was, you know, it had been percolating in our heads for a while, but that was the push that was needed. So now we breed, raise and train the Goldens. We've done a poodle, two poodle litters, one Doberman litter, um, but you know, it should be Goldens from here on out. I love Goldens as service dogs. I think they are the top of the problem is it's hard to find a good breeder who's doing the right things for it. So this isn't about all of that yet, but it's about is a service dog right for you? So because of what I do, right? I talk to a lot of people who are wondering, is a service dog right for me? And they can fill out the application, you know, check out the website and schedule up a phone call with us. But I thought, you know, since I do talk to multiple people during the week, and a lot of them have these type of questions that we would just kind of make this a maybe every other week thing and go through and say the answers to some of these questions that we get. And is a service dog right for me is a big one. Um, I'll get people, they'll see us out in public working with the dogs and come up and ask if they too could have a service dog. And as we talk, um, there are a couple requirements for having a service dog. And the first one, the biggest one is you have to have a disability, right? Um, and I've got people, that's my first question is, you know, do you have a disability? And some people will just come out and start telling me, you know, 20 things that are wrong with them. Um, some people will say, no, there's nothing wrong with me. I just want to take my dog everywhere. And I'm like, well, thank you for being honest, but you can't. Um, some people will tell me, you know, I just got diagnosed with this, or I haven't been diagnosed yet. A doctor won't diagnose me, but we need to delve into that a little bit more. Right. So I do like a person to have the, the medical support care going on with that. I don't want them to just self-diagnose, think they have something and there we go. Bada boom, you know, let's do up a service dog for you. However, I've also worked with doctors who tell one of them was telling me that I was faking it. I wasn't faking it. And, you know, I know it can be a little difficult. So I do recommend people work with their doctor. Uh, with tasks, with them knowing that, you know, you do have a service dog. But so the first thing is a service dog right for you, you have to have a disability. And it doesn't have to be five different disabilities. You know, it, it, you read the ADA frequently asked questions about service dogs. And one of the things that said in there is if you have depression and the dog reminds you to take your pills, you know, you could have a service dog. Um, it doesn't have to be, well, I'm in a wheelchair and can't move or, you know, I'm diabetic and my sugar really fluctuates a whole bunch. There are, you know, the mobility type of dogs, there's the scent type of dogs, there's the psychiatric type of dogs. There's all sorts of service dogs. It's not just if you don't have diabetes, you can't have a service dog. Uh, a question was just asked in our chat here. How do you recommend to bring up having a service dog with your doctor? And this is a great question. And I just come out and tell them, um, you know, because I, this is what I do. It's what I've been doing, but I remember back the first time and it was hard to bring it up. You know, you don't know exactly how to bring it up. Uh, what I would recommend doing is doing some Google research, right. And come up with some tasks that will help you and you know, your opinion, what would help you and talk to your doctor about it and say, Hey, you know, for me personally, I have dysautonomia, which is otherwise known as POTS. Um, and more specifically, it's the neurocardiogenic syncope one. And as we were talking to the doctor about it, um, like I said, we had the faker doctor, but even normal doctors who don't think you're faking, you can say to them, you know, hey, I, I've got this, uh, you know, for personally, my um, blood pressure, my heart rate can go wonky um, with dysautonomia. It's basically everything that your autonomic nervous system does which is, you know, things you don't think about autonomic, right? So it's your heart rate, it's your blood pressure, it's breathing, it's, um, you know, blood pooling, everything like that. Uh, it's funky or wonky is my technical term for it. So what do I train my dogs for, for helping me? Well, they're trained in light mobility, which is brace to help me get up and down. 
counterbalance if I am walking and feel wonky. Uh, forward momentum pull because sometimes my legs just don't want to go anymore. Uh, they can be taught sense alerts for whenever, I don't know if it's cortisol, pulse, blood pressure, but I just call it my wonky times. Um, they've been, I've trained multiple dogs for that for multiple people because when they find out I have this autonomia, I get a lot of people who have it. Uh, they are taught to get underneath my legs when I'm lying down to help raise the legs to get the blood from pooling in the legs to in my core where it's supposed to be. Because uh, remember, that's another one of those autonomic dysfunctions that happens, right? As your blood pools in your legs and doesn't come up where it's supposed to. Uh, DPT, which is deep pressure therapy, but leaning in. So the doctor had told me when we were talking the first time I saw Dr. Uh, Trevinos, who I see, that from um, chest to knees, he wanted me in compression hose and compression garment. I said, that's not going to happen because it's Florida and I get hot and yeah, it's going to be really uncomfortable. But what happens is after you eat, the blood goes to your stomach to help digest. And that means there's less blood in you know, places like your head where there should be blood. So you don't pass out. Uh, what we do is we'll train a DPT, but then a lean against me. Um, or if I'm lying down and don't feel good, we'll also train that lean against me and the compression is to prevent the blood from pooling. So, you know, talking with people and people share a lot, you do have to watch because some people don't know what they're talking about. Um, so, you know, I, I don't want to say, you know, just look on Google, YouTube and TikTok, but like those are great places to start um, with some tasks that would help you. So you have the tried and true, right? Like if you're diabetic or if you have epilepsy, you're going to say like, I'm a shoe in for this. But I've talked to people who are like, well, I don't know, because some days I feel really good and I don't want to take a service dog from somebody who needs it more than I do. And I said, hold on, there's not so many service dogs to go around. And if we give one to you, somebody who really needs it, I say with air quotes, isn't going to get one you know, like there's one for you and one for them and one for other people who need it also. So don't ever feel like maybe I'm not disabled enough. If the service dog helps you, what they have to be is trained to mitigate your disability with work or performing tasks. And if it helps you and mitigates you, you know, good. And then bring it up with your doctor and you're going to get some doctors who just say, no, that's not, mm -mm, no, you don't need a service dog. I talk to people all the time and I'll tell them I do part-time wheelchair and it is a lifesaver. Um, I'll sometimes think like, ah, oh, I don't need it. I'm just going into the grocery store to get a couple of things. Well, a couple of things turn into more than a couple of things. And I end up having to sit down or lie down in the middle of the store and have people coming up to me and asking me if I'm okay. And, you know, they want to sit with me the whole time instead of just leave me be so I can reboot. Um, but I talk to people who have what I have and their doctor says, no, I don't want you to have a wheelchair because then you'll lose muscle tone and you won't get out and thinking, but you don't get out now. You know, you, you don't want to leave because so often I would just send my husband out to the store because I can't, I just can't today. Uh, and it's very difficult. So even if your doctor says, no, I don't think you need a service dog. You can, if you have a medical care team, you can talk to another one, or um, I do like to have a, something from the doctor saying that, yes, in their opinion, you would benefit from having a service dog. Some doctors are no longer doing that, right? Uh, so what I recommend doing is logging into your patient portal and printing up saying where it says what your, uh, what you have, like mine, it'll say, um, I have, you know, POTS and neurocardiogenic syncope and dysautonomia and um, EDS and a whole bunch of other things. So print that up, print that page up from your session, highlight that and keep that, right? So then even if he's saying, oh, you don't need a service dog. Well, yeah, but look at, look at what all I've got. And here's how the service dog's trained to mitigate those disabilities that I have. I have fibromyalgia. There are, here's a question. There aren't a lot of, a ton of resources for related tasks. As you came from ability, so those tasks aren't super relevant. Uh, no, but here, so people want, mobility dog um, because then they don't need a cane and that's the wrong way to look at it. Uh, a cane in the long run, in the short run is way cheaper than a service dog, right? So is a wheelchair. I don't care how bougie of a wheelchair you get, it's going to be cheaper than a service dog. So, but what about retrieve? Would that help you? If retrieve to go get your meds and bring them to you so you don't have to go and get them. Fibromyalgia, you probably get, uh, in my opinion, in my, not opinion, in my experience, I guess would be a better term. 
you might get uh, sore, you know, like your joints might get achy. So it might be good to have the DPT. So it is like a little portable heating pad for you. Um, and then if you have, you know, like to go get my meds, I like that and not just retrieve what I drop. Uh, Cause mine know that it's, I call it my oops retrieve. So they know if I drop something, come pick it up and give it to me, especially if I say, oops. Uh, and then if it's something that they shouldn't, like I drop my pills, it's going to be, no, don't, don't get that one. But, uh, but that's a good one. I have a list on the hopeservicedogs.org site. And I believe it's also on the heart soul canine.com site of it's the grand task list, task list. And what it is, is it's a bunch of tasks that either we have trained or we've had requests to train or people have said that they liked over the years and we've assembled it into one to make it easier for people so they can print it off, they can go through it, they can circle what it is that they like. And then you can go through and say, look, everything that I need is a retrieve based task. Like that's gonna help, like as a service dog, right for you, that would help me out immeasurably. And as you go through this brainstorm and write down everything, write down what, what you're dealing with, right? And then you can go through and say, well, I'm dealing with, like, I am so sore and achy in the morning and I, I'm cold and I want my blanket. I just can't reach and grab my blanket and put it on me, but that would help out so much. Well, you could train a dog for that also. So then you don't have to have the blanket there. And then I'll get people who say things like, well, I want the dog to turn on and off the lights for me. Just have Alexa do that. Like, so there are some things that um, I fall down and this isn't just me. Okay. Somebody calls me up, right? They fall down. Sometimes they're out in the woods and they'll fall down and they want the dog to go get help. Yeah. But like, so you're asking your dog to play Lassie and to go up to a rando, you know, house somewhere and say, you know, Hey, follow me. Timmy fell down a well. And, and for those, I say, just get an Apple watch or any of the, I'm sure all of the watches have the follow alerts on them and it'll tell the uh, EMTs, it'll tell all your emergency medical contacts in there exactly where you are. And so for me, that is so much safer. And for us, like, I don't do a lot of diabetic alert dogs anymore because everyone has a Dexcom. Now, does that mean if you're diabetic and you have a Dexcom, you don't get a service dog? No, what if you're, it's really wonky, right? What if you have lows and highs and lows and highs and those lows, those are the deadly ones, right? So what if you have that or, or you're what's called a brittle diabetic and you have the Dexcom and it's helping, but you know what? Sometimes equipment malfunctions. You know, sometimes the dog can sleep through it. And apparently, and I didn't know this until, you know, I started working with them. Um, like there's two or three in the morning is like death hour for diabetics. And it's whenever you're in a deep REM sleep and your sugar dips really low. And if it dips too low, sometimes you don't come out of it. So like, these are things that now think if you have a parent whose kid's been diagnosed with diabetes of any age, you could be 50 years old and you're still a kid, <laughs> you know, and your parent finds out about it. But, you know, anything to help people to sleep better at night is, is going to help. So it's not, well, you got a Dexcom, you don't get a service dog. But there's going to be, this is the question though, is a service dog right for you? Will the medical device take care of it? So I told you guys already, I pass out, right? If I know I'm going to pass out, I take off my Apple watch. <laughs> because if I'm going to, I know where I am. I know like my dog's with me or my husband's with me or my family's with me. So I don't need an EMT coming. Now, if I was in a city on my own, like I traveled last summer to Texas for a seminar. Yeah, I would have left the Apple Watch on and then I have somebody there, right? So like if I do go out and I don't come back for a while, like the EMTs would come and find me because it gives them the exact GPS coordinates. It's pretty neat. Um, other questions that come up, I was lucky I was um, someone... Uh, that's exactly what I have. And I'm lucky to see a pod doctor who actually when I get a service dog and write you a letter, shut up. That's awesome. Uh, PTSD crowds cause me to come agitated. My golden doodle does go behind me to keep people off my back. Yeah. Thank you so much uh, from fibromyalgia. DPT and retrieve would be great. I'll go look up that list. Perfect. And, um, and for that, just so we're not using names because it will be um, recorded and all. So that's why I, I know your name's not fibromyalgia. Um, so PTSD in crowds. So we do a lot with that. And so for a lot of people with PTSD and anxiety, um, in my experience, again, um, 
it helps out tremendously, right? But you're going to be getting more attention too, because you have the dog. Uh, so for that, it's, um, you know, what works better for you. And I always encourage people, if anyone is thinking that they might want to serve a dog, come down and hang out with us for a couple of days. Like, trust me, I'll put you to work. We've got dogs here who, you know, like having a new person to work with them is always going to be awesome. If you want to hit up Disney or Universal, even if you don't want to buy a pass to get in, we can hang out at City Walk. We can go to some places and you can just see if a service dog is right for you by working with us and seeing. Because a lot of times whenever they first come out with us, you know, my client, you know, people do where they first go out with their service dog, they're not expecting all the questions and all the comments constantly and no matter what you put on your vest it's going to happen you know because people just they see dog and they i think their brain shuts off um so with ptsd what happens sometimes is people will say what task is he trained for right well he, he comforts me that's emotional support right and we didn't even cover this yet it's not a so for a service dog and i love that that you put in here what your dog does for you right um, which is goes behind my back to keep people off my back. Um, so you can use it to create space. And we'll do that with teaching a heel. And the opposite of that is side and then a block in front of you and a cover behind you. Um, we can do a, a watch my six, which is it's a sit facing you, but at your side. So they're facing behind you, but people will come in still and try to get pets. So other ones that are good for PTSD, again, in our experience are the DPT possibly retrieve meds, um, get me out of here, you know? And how does that work? Well, like a lot of the stores, all Walmarts are pretty much the same. I think there's three Walmart layouts you can choose from. And as the dog gets it, we use um, some different techniques and teach the dogs to find the exits. So you can do the same thing, find a chair or find a bathroom um, if you have IBS. And yeah, that, that could definitely be a, a task and something because you've got grounding then, right? Um, we'll do the the lap the dpt um we'll also do a hugs um you can do like where they come up into your lap facing you um they, they come up and they put your head their head right there on your chest and they kind of make that little connection with you and i tell you what that really helps to block out everything else going on around you and um, then the dpts come over your lap um, the hugs can just be hugs, put the head on, on your lap, put head in your hand for grounding. So there's a lot that can be, and we just, I told you we had two liters of poodles. We're doing, uh, we just finished up the go home weekend for the six month old poodles to go home. And one of the, the um, new owners of them is like, oh my gosh, I just love the dog's poof. And it is so good tactile wise. You know, like I could get lost in that. Well, guess what happens when that happens? Everything else gets blocked out. So there's so many that can be, uh, but you're still going to get people who, well, that's not a real service dog because you're not in a wheelchair. And, and no, like it all works, but, you know, just no task wise. Um, and then here's going to be an offshoot is uh, if somebody says there's two questions. Do I have that on here? I think I do. There's two questions people can ask. Um, and this is the gatekeepers, right? Which is like the greeter at Walmart or security at Universal. It's not every employee there who sees you. And it's not definitely not weirdos who come up to you and ask you questions. You don't have to answer them at all. But the gatekeepers can ask two questions. Is that a service dog required because of a disability? Yes. Or yes, he's in training here in Florida. We use that because again, I do a lot of started puppies. And what task or work has the dog been trained to perform? And for that, it could be, what is, what is block? Medical response, right? Um, you know, you can say block, you can say whatever you want to. I try not to share any more information with randos than I need to. With you guys, I share everything because we do get that um, deeper relationship, you know, for that trust factor there. So like everybody knows I pass out. You know, it's like, yeah, that's my fun. That's why I'm sitting here in my chair and my feet are up to help the blood from pooling in the legs. Sitting with feet up helps me out tremendously. Um, so if we take a group of five puppies to Universal and they say, well, what task does the dog do? Sometimes I'll go and say, well, this one's in training for this and that and the other. And sometimes it's just a general medical alert response and recovery, maybe light mobility, 
But I tell you what, I'm taking eight week old puppies in, out and people are like, what is it? Well, light mobility at <laughs> some point in the future. So usually I try to do what, what works, right? But I don't have to say, he has PTSD, he, she has fibromyalgia, they have um, dysautonomia. So I try to keep that part out of it. And sometimes if you say, you know, medical alert, and they say, well, like, what does he do for medical alert? You can say he monitors my medical condition and lets me know before it hits DEFCON 5 or whatever the bad DEFCON is, right? Um, or lets me know before, so I can take action to prevent the medical response and recovery from having to happen. Um, or well, what does he do for medical response, right? Um, he helps create a social, or he helps create a spatial barrier. Oh, well, that sounds really, in or here's my favorite that I'll do is if it's medical alert, and they say, well, what's that? And I'll say, have you heard of diabetic alert dogs? And they say, yeah. I say, it's just like that. I didn't say he was a diabetic. It's just, he's like a diabetic, right? So for me, those work out really good. So you need to have the tasks. And I've had people come who want a mobility dog and they bring me like a little chihuahua. So like, well, what do you need from the chihuahua? Well, I just need to hold on to the leash and that helps me. Well, yeah, but that could be a purse strap. Like if you, there's issues with having very small or very big dogs, right? Um, and even if the dog was the best retriever, he is a, what, what a chihuahua was six, seven, eight, nine pounds, you know, unless he's a really fat chihuahua in which case no. So like, what's he going to be retrieving? You know, granted they don't retrieve bowling balls, but I want them to be able to like pick up and hand to me like a remote control if I drop it and not like not be able to pick it up or well he can only pick up you know like a pen because that's it now what happens to me I always drop pens and that's all I still I want to try to get a dog that is going to fit um I also have people who now I'm not a little person I'm over six foot tall I'm a big person um you know I'll get Great Danes coming in sometimes for um, for boarding, boarding trains, whenever we were doing outside dogs. And to me, I'm like, this is, the, it's so nice to have a dog that's tall like that whenever you're tall. Like it's easier to, to feed them. It's, you know, treat them while we're out in public. I don't have to, you know, bend over and squat and stuff. Like he is right there. I can walk with my hand on his back sometimes. And it is so nice. But there's a lot of problems with having a Great Dane as a service dog or any huge breed like that is, First, their lifespan is a lot less than um, medium-sized dogs, like a golden, which is still a medium-large size. And that's that's what I like, you get 10 to 12, maybe 14 years of life, not working usually all of that, but it depends on what it is. Um, so these are things to think about. Well, now, if you travel a lot, you might not want a Great Dane as a service dog or a Newfoundland as a service dog, because they're huge and they take up a lot of room. So people who travel a lot, and they come to me, they're probably going to be encouraged to get a female because they're usually a little smaller than the males, just for that reason, just size wise. Um, but, you know, things that you need to think about is the breed. If you're thinking about this, if all your tasks are mobility based tasks, don't get the chihuahua, you know, but you also don't have to, there's this weird infographic that goes around that says that the dog has to be like half of your height and like a third of your weight or something like that. That's made up right? Um, my last service dog, uh, Gypsy, like I said, I'm over six foot tall. She's, I think maybe 21 inches and like 65 pounds. And she could do brace for me because I'm very conscientious of weight I put on. Um, she could do the forward momentum pull. She could do the counterbalance. You know, I'm not going to say pull me in my wheelchair through the park. Um, but you know, you don't have to say, well, my dog's 60 pounds and he should be 65 pounds to be like whatever the weight one is. So I'll just feed him like a whole bunch of McDonald's hamburgers. So he puts on the extra five pounds. So he makes this mythological, you know, figure for, for what his size should be. Just be smart when you're doing them. And it's too, we're, we'll talk another time about where to find what to look for and all, but it's, it's why I recommend going to a breeder who, you know, can tell you how big the dog's going to be. You don't want to go to the shelter and get the dog that's supposed to be the chihuahua and he ends up being a Great Dane or who's supposed to be huge and he ends up being 20 pounds and it's happened. And then you're like, well, <laughs> the dog's not big enough to do what I need him to do. Uh, you need to be able to care for the dog, right? They're service dogs. 
they still are going to require training. Even once you're placed, even once you've worked with them for a while, you still, if you don't use it, you're going to lose it. So, you know, even if you just run them through real quick, you know, what he likes to do, work on tricks, you know, whatever it works, you are still going to have to keep up with it. And if you, I know myself personally, I used to go through about six weeks, two to three times a year where I was bad. And, you know, it was enough for me to get from the bed to the chair to the couch and, and just, you know, be around the house. I can still do stuff with the dog, right? I can do box work. I can do touch. I can do drop something and pick it up and bring it to me. Or luckily I have my husband and son who also, you know, can, can work the dogs. And now I have, you know, my assistants, my other trainers. So it makes it a lot easier for me, but it might not for you. Uh, but you need to be able to keep up with the training, just getting the dog, even if you get a two to three-year-old, because apparently they're more three-year-old now, uh, whenever they're being placed, if you go through a program, they're still going to require that upkeep, just like your car does, just like, hey, my phone needs to like update software. Your dog needs those updates also. Uh, and you need to pick up after your dog too, potty-wise. Um, now, if you're like, if I'm in the middle of an episode, like that's probably not going to happen. But I've also had people, well, he's a service dog, so I don't have to pick up his poop. And I'm like, oh, yes, you do. Um, you know, don't, don't, don't tell me this. Um, but it is things that you do have to care for the dog. Talk to the medical care team, medical device, your task list. So I told you we have the big list of tasks. Go through it and, and see what would help you, right? And then what I want you to do is go through the, what you've wrote down, what you found on TikTok and Google and YouTube and the task list and everything. Because there's a bunch of task lists, like I said, that I, I kind of went and narrowed it down to my, my grandmaster task list. Um, see what will help you now, see what will help you in the future. Because you're not just training the dog for where you're at now. So you get an eight-week-old puppy or a six-month-old puppy or even a two-year-old dog, and you're hoping to get, say, eight to 10 years with this dog as your partner, what do you think you're going to be in 10 years? You know, now if you're thinking, well, I have MS and in 10 years, I don't know where I'm going to be. I might be in a wheelchair. I might not be or dysautonomia, same thing. Well, you know, if you're thinking it might be happening sooner rather than later, you need to train your dog around that equipment. You know, if you're thinking I'm in and out of hospitals a lot, well, train your dog with the beeps and the whooshes that come from the hotel or the hospital rooms. You know, if you travel a lot, get your dog used to airplanes and buses and hotel rooms and Ubers because it's what your dog's going to be um, used to. Um, we want to make sure that everybody's set up for success. And that's one good way to do it is think of what you're going to need for the future, not just for the present. And the best time to train the tasks are when you're feeling good. So when I'm feeling good, I will work my dogs so much, you know, not like crazy amount of work, but like, I will make sure I work them. So those times when I'm really not doing good and they just get the bare minimum that they need that break too. And for mine, like a lot of times they're with me whenever I'm not doing good. I remember last year, I really wasn't feeling good at all. Uh, Gypsy wore her harness in the house the whole day. And I used it even walking, you know, across the room. Uh, she was in her harness with me. Uh, and usually I don't do harnesses in the house, like, cause I can usually get from point A to point B. It's just out in public where it's walking longer that it doesn't help as much. But like I said, we, I made sure she wore that uh, cause it was definitely needed. But you're gonna get a lot of attention, a lot of questions, a lot of stares, a lot of comments. Um, especially whenever you put booties on your dog and then everybody says, oh, the dog has booties. Why does your dog have booties on? Or when we do Universal and Disney, it's, uh, you know, why, what's your dog's name? Why do you want to know? Because then you're going to call him and then he's going to look at you because he's young and he's learning and then I'm going to correct him. And it's all your fault because you're asking what my dog's name is. Some people, they want to do a, a fake name which is welcome. My dogs are on social media. I don't do fake names, um, but sometimes I don't answer to them. Like if you're going to ask my dog's name before you ask my name, you don't get either, you know? Um, and, and like, why do you want to know? I didn't ask your kid's name. Everything you do with the service dog is going to take longer. So I told you there are times I'm like, oh, I'm just going to the store for like two things. 
I don't need the dog. I don't need the wheelchair. Yeah, I need both of them every time. Because if not, when you're out and about, you're going to say, oh my gosh. So say you're a busy mom and you have three, your dad, you know, whatever works. And you have like three kids under the age of five and you're getting them ready. You know, you're staying home and you take care of, of running the whole household. Do you want a dog to add to that? Like, it can help, but it's also instead of getting three kids and you ready and loaded up into the car, it's three kids, you and a dog ready and loaded up into the car. So everything's going to take longer. You have to potty the dog, right? If the dog has tummy issues, you have to get that dealt with. Um, you know, you don't want explosive diarrhea in the store. It's not fun when that happens. Uh, and if the dog is having a bad day, are you going to leave him home or are you going to stay home with them too? I'm not saying you have to stay home with your dog all the time, but when you get reliant on a service dog, it's really hard to go back to not having a service dog. Um, and so everything's gonna take longer. Make sure that he's clean, right? Brushed out and groomed, nails are done, ears are clean. The vest looks good. If your vest is dirty, you're gonna to have to, of course, get that washed. If the harness is dirty, you're gonna to have to get that cleaned. Uh, making sure he has his booties, making sure you have uh, water for him, you know, for in the car and his water bowl and poop bags. And, you know, I have a buck out bag I call it and and it's in the van and I put it on the wheelchair whenever we go and sometimes I run out of things so you have to make sure that whatever you run out of you fill up and if we're out and about with our dogs or with client dogs you know we've got this buck out bag to make it easier and I show them and part of the online course actually has this is what's in my buck out bag it's an extra pair of booties an extra leash an extra collar um, some cooling towels just in case you know, a toy, um, medical stuff for me uh, in case, you know, whatever's needed. Um, not only booties, but toddler socks for the dogs, vet wrap for the dogs. Uh, and then if I go someplace, if I do go out of town, I have to pack more stuff for them. So I have a master packing list that I will print up and my dog has a whole column. Me, my husband, my son, we share two columns with everything. But my, son, but my dog has a full column on things that I need to bring for them. Uh, you know, rain jacket, an extra vest in case they do get caught in the rain and it gets soaked, you know, well, then it has to dry. So we have, um, we had had before, I think I still have it somewhere. Um, I had a vest, a harness that I liked that was just webbing and it was thick webbing, but it was really nice for those times that whenever you're going to be out in the rain, which in Florida is every afternoon in the summer is going to be a downstorm, you know, and you don't want the dog soaking wet, or are you going to bring a a rain jacket on. Well, again, we're in Florida, even if it's raining, it's mid eighties to mid nineties and it's really hot. So the rain can be really nice. It's just, you're soaked afterwards, but I don't, I don't like wearing a raincoat during that time. I'd rather do an umbrella if anything. And so I figure for the dog, it might be the same thing that that rain is, is nice. It's refreshing for them, but what's not refreshing is wearing a soaking wet vest the whole rest of the time. Cause you might evaporate dry and like a, oh yeah, in Florida know. you'll you'll dry in about three minutes, but still the the fabric takes longer. Um, care for the dog before yourself. You know, if the dog needs something, you have to see through it. If the dog has to go to the bathroom, you have to let him out. So there are things that we'll do. Um, for example, we have doggy doors. We're on five acres and it's fully fenced, and then we have a dog yard too. So for some people, it might be um, let's put a doggy door. For us, it's on the storm door. So I can close the main door and they don't have access to it or I can open it and they have access and they can come and go as they please, right? So you can do that and then fence a little bit of the yard depending on the size of your dog and everything. You can even use like X-Pen or again, we're in the country. So, you know, I'm gonna mention it. You can use like cow fencing or horse fencing or hog fencing and fence off a little area there so they can go out and potty. And then if you're having one of those really bad days or you can't get out of bed, like they can still do that um, we have a lot of dogs. And so one of the things we do is instead of doing bowls of water everywhere, we've got a bunch of bowls of water outside that we fill up multiple times a day in the kitchen. We have it. And then in the bathroom, we have it. Um, because like, why would I put it in the living room or in the bedroom? Right. So it's in the bathroom and because we've got the dogs, it is a big bucket. So I fill that up every morning, whenever I get in my shower and I leave it in there. So people who come, they're like, Oh, do you have a leak in your shower? No, it's a dog's water bowl. Cause then if they knock it over, it's not going to spill all over. Cause it's a walk-in shower. Like it works. Uh, you know, but it's stuff like, I have to do that. Even if I'm like, I don't feel like this today. Like, I don't feel like training them today. Like I just need to rest and do nothing. Either have somebody come out or say like, okay, the door's open. They've got water. 
I'm good to go. Like I can go lie down and it'll be fine. Uh, size, the coat, medical care too, um, and coat. So for the size of your dog, for what breed you're thinking, because everyone's already thinking breeds and you know it, right? There are some breeds I usually don't recommend. Um, I don't recommend, want to look at what the dog was bred for, right? So there's a reason I like golden retrievers, Labrador retrievers and standard poodle, which is a retriever. So German retriever type of thing, right? Like they are working dogs. They're not just circus dogs, right? Standard poodles are, are good for it. Um, what might not be good? A guardian breed dog. You know, yeah, we've worked with some, but what's their base? What are they going to go back to? They're going to go back to guarding. Do you want that? If I'm passed out in the middle of a store and people are trying to come up and help me and the dog's standing over me growling at people, you don't want that. Um, and you're going to find every now and then what's called a unicorn, which is like a guardian breed type who's going to be perfect for this. But if you're looking, if you want to have the most success, I don't recommend it. Uh, I don't recommend the, the houndy ones too, because their nose for the sniffy dogs, like um, beagles, right? B uh, bloodhounds, their nose or um, sight hounds, their eyes are going to be like what they want. So it's going to be like squirrel, boom, I'm at the squirrel. Oh, where's mama? I don't know. Um, don't recommend even like Siberian Huskies, which were popular a couple of years ago. I was getting so many calls from people who wanted Siberian Huskies. And um, I told them this isn't Game of Thrones. But, uh, you know, they're my first dog, that first dog I was telling you about that we met in the park and, you know, trained her up and everything. That was a Siberian Husky. I would never do that again. Um, they're just, their first love is to run. You know why Golden works out really good? Their first love is you. <laughs> um, and food, but you. Uh, so you want to look at that. You want to look at coat. You know, if you live up north, you might not want a smooth coated dog. If you live down in Florida, you might not want a big, woolly, fluffy coated dog you know, because it's gonna, they're gonna be more uncomfortable. Um, the the short haired dog, you can always get jackets on him and stuff. The long haired dog, you can keep him brushed out. Uh, so, you know, he is cool, maybe use cooling vests and all that, but it's just setting your dog up for as much success as you can while you're thinking about it. I've had people who want that tactile and they like the smooth coat of, you know, a shaved poodle, or they love the smooth coat of a Doberman. And so that's really one of the reasons why they did the breed that they did is because that really helped them out tremendously. Um, or they really don't like the, um, the longer coat of a golden because it's just too much coat. You know, well, there's field line goldens that don't have as much coat as show line goldens, but we've had both here, um, goldens and uh, labs and crates that board and train at the same time. And the lab had a moat of, of fur around his crate and the golden had tumbleweeds that would blow, you know? So like everyone needs some brushing, even the, the dogs need, you know, some uh, like a, getting a chamois and, and getting them good, spreading out the oils and all. Medical, what are the medical issues in your breed? So goldens, you have a high rate of cancer and hip dysplasia. Those are the two big ones with goldens. Uh, so we do what we can to prevent that from happening, right? Um, Dobermans have a big problem with hearts um, and DCM, dilated cardiomyopathy. Um, poodles, they can be a little nervy. They can have um, teeth and jaw issues. Um, medical wise, I'm not going to be the greatest on what it is. I make sure all my dogs are fully health tested. I'm um, on my breeding dogs, all the potential studs. And I know it was really difficult to find. There's a reason we did one litter with the Dobermans and that was it. It's very difficult to find a stud that checked everything that I wanted. Um, poodles, we've used two different studs and those were still difficult to come by um, because some of them were, you know, the dog has bare hips and therefore it's breedable and they did no other health testing. And I'm like, not for service dogs, I want better. Um, and you guys want better, uh, but, you know, check and see what the medical issues are with the dog that you're thinking of. What the breed, you know, breed, those genetics, we had a border collie we moved out to the country here and we got goats and you should have seen it was like a switch flipped on in the border collie when he saw these goats for the first time and he knew exactly what to do and he herded them up into a circle and he tap danced and he was so proud of himself and so happy we didn't teach him that he's never been around goats you know he just he, genetics kick in 
right? Um, and then career length. So I was telling you earlier too, that the big dogs, Mastiffs, Newfoundlands, Great Danes are gonna have a shorter lifespan and a shorter than working lifespan than the more medium sized dogs, which is like 50 to 70 pounds, 60 to 80 pounds. That's what I, I like. Um, if you're gonna go, well, my golden's 120 pounds. What do you mean yours are 60 to 80 pounds? Yeah, I would check health testing on the mom and dad of your dogs um, because Americans do like to breed everything big. Uh, the Dobermans that we bred, I think mama was 55 to 60 pounds. And for some people they're like, but no, like my female Doberman's twice that. And I'm like, yeah, it's probably, probably gonna have health issues if you're breeding twice as big, right? I'm not saying they're gonna, but it's something you're gonna have to check into and make sure. So as you're wondering, is a service dog right for me? There's a lot that you do have to think about, right? It's not just a, yes, I want a dog, it'll be so cool. But it's an, a real look inward to see if you're ready for it emotionally, um, if you're ready for it energy-wise, if you're ready for it health-wise. For some people, they don't want because it's then admitting that there is a problem um, or that people will know that they have a problem. And you also have to come to the point where you just, I, I don't care. Like I, I have a very good resting bitch face apparently. So whenever we're out, a lot of times people don't ask me the questions anymore. Um, having, you know, my hope shirt on, people also assume that I'm training the dog for other people. Um, or if I'm in the wheelchair, they usually just leave me alone. You know, they might say, oh, what a pretty dog. Thank you. Like, I didn't choose him because he was pretty. Um, so sometimes you just don't know what to say whenever people do. So like, usually just like the ha 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 smile works out really good. Uh, but is your lifestyle good for it? is another big question that you're gonna to wanna to ask yourself. Is your lifestyle con conductive to having a service dog? You know, um, if, if you're super busy, you know, it might not be yet. If you're in school, it might not be yet, but maybe you can say like, okay, well, I'm in school or I'm a teacher, right? I've got three months off in the summer. So if I can get the dog about this age here and get going with it, and so he's ready here, that might work out really good for me. Um, you know, or you could say like, look, I've got like a year of whatever going on, building a house, like I'm super busy for this time, but I want to start looking after, well, you know, like it's going to take a while to start looking. So, you know, start thinking now, what is it that I need? When do I need it? Uh, it will take two to three years to fully train up the dogs. Um, I get people all the time, whenever I talk to them, who tell me my six month old dog is absolutely fully trained. He's absolutely perfect out in public. He's fully task trained. And guess what happens at eight months old? The dog knows nothing because they, you know, the dog just burned out. Like he just, he won't do anything anymore. Um, so they'll come to us or the dog will be super food dependent where he will only ever sit for a food each and every time. If you ask them to do something other, you know, like show me the food, feed me, and then I'll consider doing it. And you don't want that either. Um, the extra time it takes to get everything done, the extra attention, medical wise, if you can do, uh, you know, are you wanna do owner training? Do you wanna do program? Those are two, the two big ones that people will do. Programs will have a list. Uh, some programs are little cost. Some programs aren't. Um, do you want to go with a, you pick the dog and you have a trainer and that trainer works with you and the dog. If you're going to do that, you know, make sure that your trainer is familiar with service dogs and doing it. I've worked with a lot of trainers over the years who they want to put the base on the dog and then send the dog to me for the polish uh, and the service dog stuff. And I have to retrain a lot. So it's a lot easier if the dog is, or the trainer is familiar with service dogs and what's needed. And that just having a dog who's good in public is not the same as public access training. And we're gonna do a talk on that too. I've talked to a friend who's a dog trainer and um, a lot of my friends are dog trainers. Uh, and that's one of the topics that, that she had suggested. So we're gonna cover that one together because some people think, well, I take a dog into Lowe's and he does fine. We go to pet friendly restaurants and he does fine. That's the same thing as a, is public access trained, right? Mm -mm. Nope, not at all. It's potentially a foundation if it's done right. 
Um, do you want to pick a puppy or do you want to pick an adult dog? The nice thing with picking a puppy is you get to shape everything. And that's what I like to start, even though you're like, but I can't use them fully until he's two and puppies know nothing. It is nice to have that because I can shape everything that he does. There's no hidden baggage. You know, there's nothing that, well, you know, he's two and all of a sudden this happened. You know, like I, I can shape it from the get go. Um, I know what happened. It's not going to be, well, he must have been abused by a man in a hat because when he sees men in hat, he pees. Um, you know, so that's, I like that, but then you have to account in for that time. So, well, if I'm doing decent now, but not as good as I was before, and I'm probably gonna be getting worse, I might want to start looking now. And then guess what? Sometimes breeders have wait lists and, you know, get, get on the wait list. Now it's going to be a year plus before you get the dog. Then the two years of training. So like we're talking in the future, but one of the things that was just said over the weekend, uh, whenever we did the poodle go home was, you know, I said, I love doing this. I love meeting the people, you know, seeing how the dogs are going to help change their lives. It's fantastic. This is my joy. Um, it gives me so much, so much joy, so much fulfillment. And it was, well, you're not just helping the owner, right? You're helping uh, the, the whole family right? The owner's potential family at some point in the future, uh, you know, if they have kids in the future, like everyone will be helped because this dog today started it. And it, it gives me shivers. And I don't know if it's the meds or what, but I get shivers whenever, you know, like, that's good. That's good info. I like hearing that. Um, because it, it being disabled, which, you know, y'all are, you wouldn't be on here. I, it can be very isolating or feel very isolating. So what we try to do is we try to create a safe place. Um, we have different Facebook groups and we want to have a nice place where we can ask questions, right? Where we can work together with this because a lot of the online service dog communities can be quite toxic. So I don't put up with that. One of my rules in all my Facebook groups is don't piss me off. It's my favorite rule and every group should have that as a rule but it should be, don't piss me off, not, don't piss the owner off. Um, and career length, like I said, career length, we discussed anywhere from Gypsy, I just retired her. She's not even six. Um, and that made me sad, but she just, she can't do the walking anymore with, um, she had subluxation and stuff in her hips whenever she was two. Um, we didn't ever breed her, but we, um, you know, it's just, it's too hard on her getting up and down. It takes her a while to do it. So now she's anti to all the puppies that we have out here. Um, but that's, let me know, guys, I'll give you a couple minutes if you do have any questions to type in for me here. Um, but so is a service dog right for you? It's a question that only you can answer. And it's a question that you should only answer after you've thought about it and thought about you, your lifestyle, your time, your energy, um, your, your commitment to it. You know, if you have shiny object syndrome and you're like, I'll get a service dog. And then, you know, in a month, you're going to be onto something different. Give it at least a month and see if it's something that you really want to do. They can be so life-changing. And I have Albert, I'm working on training up right now. So he's one of the two that came into the room with me today. Lead is the other one. So he's been lying, you know, pretty much at my feet the whole time sleeping. That works you know, like it works out really good and he's taking to it very well. He's not even 10 months old. Uh, you know, he's doing well with it, but I want to make sure I don't burn him out too. So we don't do outings every day with him. We'll do outings like maybe every other day, maybe two a week, maybe three a week. Right. And I make sure what we did the other day, we went to the store, we went out to look at a house. We went to another store and we went to a restaurant. He came with me to one of them. And then the next day he spent most of it in his crate to rest. So, you know, it's stuff that you have to think about if you're up and moving and you're out of the house from six in the morning until six at night and there's no one else there, it might not be fair to get a dog. And then you'll say, well, but I'll just take him with me or I'll take the eight week old puppy with me everywhere. It's not fair to the dog. You know, he's going to be so exhausted. And that's with the pups, with the poodles, they're only six months old. But they, we worked here for a couple hours, then we'd go out and do an outing for about an hour or so. And the dogs were just so, so done, so done. 
we were supposed to meet up with one of them today who's staying for the week and we're just taking today off and he is just going to sleep for the day. That's what we do over the weekends is we try to do, you know, just play time with the puppies because it's so much for them. And I want them to do enjoy their childhood too. I don't want them to have a Michael Jackson childhood where he just worked the whole time and then have to build them, you know, like their own amusement park in the backyard when they're older. I don't want to do that. Um, but think about it, check out the resources and why, where are the resources at? Uh, Linktree, uh, which is L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E backslash Hope, H-O-P-E, and then S-D for service dog. So is my link tree that has everything in it. So I don't have some of those Facebook groups. Um, we do have an online course. We have TikTok, we have Instagram, we have Facebook. We try to be a little bit everywhere. We have YouTube and it kind of gives you the feel for us, for what it is that we do with Hope. Uh, if you are watching this live, you're going to have, uh, we're going to upload it to YouTube and I'll send you guys the link for it. Uh, question, can you share a little on transition between service dogs or be eight this year and I'm torn between an overlap or taking a break? That's a great question. It, it's difficult whenever you are transitioning between them because when we did Arrow to Gypsy, it was a little bit easier because Arrow was around with me, right? And so I'd work him, like if we're doing two things during the day, you know, like I'd work him and then I'd work her. And working him, I'm like, oh my gosh, he knows what I need. And that was my thought with Gypsy last month. We took her to Universal for just a couple hours and then we were doing a workshop in Orlando. So she was just going to come and, you know, basically lay at my feet during the workshop and be there if I need her. And it was so hard for her getting up and down that I'm like, that's it. Like she was retired, but you know, it was so nice for that day and a half while it lasted because she knew what I needed. Like I didn't have to tell her everything. She knew it because we've been partners and we've been doing this since she was eight weeks old. You know, so we take her out and do short outings with her. You know, like we've been together. She's been with me all the time. And now I have to transition to a new one. So Rich brought out, you know, Albert, the other one and, and took Gypsy home because luckily we're only about an hour away. But, you know, it was nice and it is nice seeing him growing. But then whenever we work with the puppies and I'm like, oh, you know nothing. You don't know your name. You don't know Sid. You know, you don't know. And, and so you can say, well, work on that. And we do, but I also want them to have fun and play. And if we teach them how to learn when they're pops, like eight weeks old to six months old, we teach them how to learn what to do to be decent on a leash, then it's a lot easier to take that and grow with it, right? A lot of the dogs that we were doing outside dogs, they'd come to us at uh, six months old, eight months old, and they're not potty trained and they're barking, jumping, and they don't know how to be on a leash and they're just little hellhounds, right? So, you know, there is a difference. And I like, I like the dogs that when they're good. So it, it's a question on where you're at. If you want to take a break, if you can take a break, if you want the dog to try to teach the new dog. So for dogs who do scent alert stuff, a lot of times people want, you know, the new dog to be taught by the older dog. If the older dog has some behavior issues, you might not want the new dog in the house with them. Um, you know, and part of it is just how you feel. Like, do you want two dogs? You might be good with just having one dog. So after, you know, after this one, and then you find the right dog, there's no rush. And a lot of times what I like to have, because we are pretty busy here, is I like a backup service dog. So if I have one that I'm training or one that's retiring, makes it easier for a backup. But because we train so many for people, I can always just grab one of them and use them. It's usually we have one here for medical alert or for mobility stuff. And, you know, anymore when we go out, I do have the wheelchair. So it's not as bad. You know, it's not like I need the mobility stuff because I have the chair. So as long as I remember to charge up the chair, I'm good to go. Sometimes I forget to charge it up and I don't have a battery. And Luke said to push the chair out of the park because it just, it died, you know, or we're out and I'm trying to like plug in at different places while we're sitting around. Um, but then I, I needed that for my momentum pool to get out of the park because the chair wasn't working. But that doesn't happen all that often. Um, so yeah, and, and it might be a time too to reflect and see while you're between dogs, you know, what it is that you really want. You know, do I really want a golden? I've had multiple breeds. I told you Siberian Husky. Um, I've had two Malinois, Doberman, the golden, 
uh, was trying with a German Shepherd and she didn't, she didn't have what it take, took to be a service dog. Um, I had a little Border Collie who again, didn't work out. Um, I've had a lot of dogs who didn't work out, right? Like I know, I know I've, I've been where you guys are and hopefully I don't have to deal with that again. But I've also had some that have had to retire early, like Gypsy retired at five and a half because of, of health, because of medical. Uh, the last one, Arrow, he died unexpectedly at like six. And I was expecting him to be able to work at least another four years. And so here I am down a service dog and we had just placed Roma, the poodle mama with somebody. So I had three and now I was down to one, like three months later. And I wasn't expecting that at all. And I kind of panicked a bit and that's how Candy came into it, the Doberman. So I thought, okay, cool, I'll get the Doberman. We imported her from uh, overseas and I thought this will be great. She's already fully grown so I can start on mobility tasks right away. And she was very good at mobility tasks. But then once I, I got to wheelchair, I didn't need just that. For me, then the retrieve, the alert and the response was a lot more important. Um, do you have any advice about imposter syndrome with getting a service dog? I know it's gonna help me a ton and give me more freedom, but I'm doubting myself whenever I have a few good days. You know, we do have the good days. And sometimes I know exactly what you're talking about, right? You think like, I don't really need them because I didn't need them. Like I'm doing really good right now. But then it's gonna come again, like your disability didn't just disappear, right? You, you can't have good days and it's okay to have good days. And those are the perfect time to be training to get the dog ready for, you know, the next adventure or work on a new task or skill that you might need or think you need, or, Hey, even if you don't need it at all, just to see if you can do it. Right. Um, but everyone feels that way. Everybody feels something when they're doing good, like, I don't really need them today. I'll just leave them at home. Well, it might be good. He might need that. You might need that and see, but what I have found personally over the years is every time I think, Oh, I won't bring them today. I'll be fine or the days that I really need them, even if I was doing great, you know, it, it gets to the point and I'm like, nope, I'm done right here. You know, like I want him and I need him here right now. Uh, and he's not here. And then it's hard going from, like I said, having that partner that you know to having a new dog. And guess what? We did this with Arrow and Jenga where the two Malin was. And when Arrow died unexpectedly at six of, of liver cancer, um, we or lung cancer, not liver cancer. Um, Django, I just could have named him Rebound because I, uh, yeah, I wanted, I missed him. Like my heart was broken, but he's not. Like you have to give each dog their own too. So for some people, that does best with having that time between them. And for others, you know, some of them switch breeds because of it or go from having a female to having a male, uh, you know, and it is hard. And, and part of that is the, I guess, the wrong expectations, right? Your expectation, okay, I got another male, I got another golden, I got another poodle, whatever. He'll be just like the other one, but younger and he's not. Um, and then same with you, you know, like I'm feeling really good today. Well, yeah, but tomorrow I might not be. Or next week, I might not be. Or next month, I might not be. So if I'm feeling great, and I've had people who have offered me their service dogs. Like, I've been doing really good lately. Like, can you find him a home where, where you know, someone can use him more than I can? I'm like, well, just because you're doing really good right now, first doesn't mean you're going to be really, doing really good next week, next month. And, like, he can still be your dog. Um, I had a client who the dog was trained for migraine alert and she moved like kitty corner across the country and the weather up there didn't affect her migraines and she got on a new med so she was no longer using him as a migraine alert dog and so one of the calls that she had with us was I don't know what to do because I'm not using him as a migraine alert dog right now because it's under control with being up here and it's under control with the new meds do I still take them out? Do I still train them? And, and again, this is a question that only you can answer. So we talked about it and said, you know, like you do travel for work. You don't know if the new areas are going to affect the migraines or not. You don't know what's going to happen with the meds. If maybe after three months or six months, it's going to not work for you anymore. 
so I wouldn't say, woohoo, I've been good for a couple of weeks. I've been good for a couple of months. I don't need the service dog anymore. Um, but if you want to, you know, like back down and do, you know, still play scent games because that's what we like to do with the medical alert dogs. Um, for the scent based, you know, we'll play, play scent games. Uh, you know, take them if you want to do dog friendly places, you know, just kind of see what happens because um, there's not one right answer which is the nice thing and the not nice thing about the dog stuff is there's not one right answer. There's multiple and it could be a whole, well, you know, like today, I don't feel like I need them. And if that's yours, say like, okay, well, I'm going to give him an easy day at home and he can just relax and watch, you know, Paw Patrol on TV because it has dogs in it. And that's the only thing I know about Paw Patrol, um, you know, or Animal Planet and he'll just relax and he'll have a, an easy, lazy day at home and we'll see how I do without him. And if halfway through the day, you're like, I need to go home and get my dog because this is just not working. You know, like, okay. Because um, I think sometimes people feel the imposter syndrome also with um, just having a disability. You know, I told you we do part-time wheelchair. Well, I do. And I can get up and walk, you know, and sometimes I do because I, I can only sit so long. Um, I don't, you know, so sometimes I'll like at Universal, if I have a group with me, I might leave the chair and go into the bathroom and then come back out and, you know, claim my chair back, or I might wheel in. I don't like to do long crowds with the chair. It's a little bit annoying, long lines. Um, and sometimes those bathrooms have the twists and turns in them to get in. That's hard enough to do with the service dog, let alone our service dog and a wheelchair. So sometimes I do have the imposter syndrome whenever we do that, or when I get out of the car and go and unload the wheelchair and I'm parking in the handicap spot, and then I get the dog out and I'm sure people are looking like, I just saw her walk. She doesn't need that. She doesn't need any of that. She's just a faker. And I'm, I'm sure. And I don't care. Like, they have no idea what's going on with me. Um, again, we get the, uh, oh, bless your heart for doing this. I'm like, this one's mine. <laughs> the ones who I'm training, I already worked today. Um, but if you guys have any ideas, suggestions on the next one, let me know. Um, you can go to the hopeservicedogs.org site and sign up for our, I think you guys might've got it already, um, but for our e-newsletter. And I will let you know there too about the new, uh, new Zoom meetings, not webinar, Zoom meetings that we're doing. Uh, we, uh, this was one I scheduled, figured we'll see how Tuesday, it was the first day I had available. Um, and it, we had a nice turnout today, um, but see how this works, maybe change it up a bit. Uh, we have Facebook groups, we have dysautonomia service dogs, we have our service dog secrets um, is our podcast. And so we have a Facebook group for that. Um, we have an online course that's called service dog secrets through teachable. Uh, and that, you know, you get the free uh, Facebook group also. So we have like a public one, a couple private ones, one for people who do in person school with us, one for people who just do online, because they are different. Um, and people take away different things from it. But we have a lot of information that we try to put out there. We've got our TikTok, uh, which I believe is Pot Service Dog. Um, we have Instagram, we have Facebook. We are all over. And we like to share as much information as we can. So like I said, if you have something, if you're like, hey, I want to know more about learning how to do scent alert or about dysautonomia service dogs or where to find a good breeder, you know, let me know because those are probably going to be on my list of oh, potentials in the future. Um, anyway, I want you guys to have a fantastic week, do something fun, uh, and, uh, with your dog or without your dog. Um, and then I will see you guys next time.